Nintendo is no stranger to peripherals. If anything, they're the company most guilty of dabbling in extra pieces of hardware to enhance the experience. From those clunky plastic guns of the NES, to the N64's Rumble Pack, to even now with Amiibos, Nintendo has a lengthy and ongoing history of bits and bobs you could plug into a controller or console. But perhaps one of the most elaborate and archaic peripherals they ever tried was the e-reader. This giant Game Boy Advance cartridge with a scanner on the inside that could read the dot codes on collectible trading cards. Oh man, I remember the first time I ever saw this thing was on that GameCube trailer disc. Yeah, you guys know the one. It had a bunch of commercials and trailers for tons of upcoming GameCube games, but tucked away in the corner was this little advertisement for a thing called the e-reader. This bizarre idea of swiping a card to load a game instead of inserting a disc or a cartridge, it sounded so weird and cool. I wasn't even really thinking about what kind of games would even be available for it. I just thought the device itself was really cool and exciting. And at the time, I was also a really big fan of Digimon Tamers, so in my head, it looked like this. Read error. It wasn't nearly as cool as I thought it was gonna be. Read error. Ah! I blew 40 goddamn dollars on this thing back when it first came out. I remember the exact day it happened, too. I was standing in Toys R Us with my mom right beside me as I stared at this exact same e-reader sitting there on the shelf. And she tried to warn me. Oh, she did. She was telling me stuff like, uh, why don't you spend your money on a game instead? Uh, why don't you use your allowance on something you think you'll get more use out of? But I didn't listen at all, no. This freaking kid right here wanted a goddamn e-reader, and I argued with her for like 10 minutes until she finally gave Gave up and let me waste my money on this stupid piece of plastic. I should have listened to my mom. I got very little use out of it. I played the Game & Watch game it came with a couple of times. I played DK Jr. like twice. You needed so many cards to even make that one work. What a waste of time. As a device that could load and play games, I was incredibly disappointed with it. To say the selection was limited would be an understatement. It was mostly just NES games that I already owned or had access to in some shape or form. Though I was born in 94, I still grew up with the NES because my dad had one in the household by the time I was born. So. All of these games, they were old news to me. And even if my dad didn't have that one on NES, I had it in Animal Crossing, and I was able to play it that way. Wait, yeah, Animal Crossing. Yeah, that was one of the biggest advertised features of this thing. It's compatibility with Animal Crossing. The e-reader came bundled with this one Animal Crossing card, and once scanned, it would give you a little message telling you to go somewhere in-game to scan it. So, hey, let's hook it up to the GameCube, let's scan it there, and now we get a letter from K.K. Slider. He explains how you can use villager cards to get bonuses and extra items and stuff. And at that very moment, a can of worms had been opened. If I wasn't going to be able to use this thing to play cool games, I was at least going to use it to see every last weird little thing in Animal Crossing. At the time, the original Animal Crossing was my favorite video game. I wanted to see every last weird little thing that game was hiding. And the e-reader, it seemed to me, was the key to unlocking exactly that. One of my life's biggest regrets is not buying all of Toys R Us's e-reader cards after they all went on clearance. They were selling packs for 50 cents each. Nobody wanted these. Even as a kid, I could tell they weren't selling. I remember buying a couple of packs, but soon after, I decided to take my mom's advice and more wisely spend my money. So instead of blowing my allowance on more Animal Crossing e-reader cards, I saved up for one of the greatest Zelda games ever made. That was a really good decision, but even still, I couldn't help but to wonder my whole life if these cards ever offered anything of interest. For years, these cards occupied a small spot in the back of my brain, practically begging me to someday revisit them. So let's go down this weird little rabbit hole that is Animal Crossing's compatibility with the e-reader. I have a lot of these cards, at least two of each type, so we're gonna see every single little ass thing this machine does to this game. Animal Crossing always was a pretty good fit for Nintendo's weird experiments. Remember the Wii Speak? Nintendo's bizarre answer to outcries from fans who wanted voice chat like Xbox had. But why would we put out a headset like any normal company? No, let's slap a little mic thing on your TV that picks up everything in the entire room. Animal Crossing City Folk was the first, and one of the only games to use this. Yeah, Animal Crossing was the first game they thought to add voice chat to. No, not Smash, not Mario Kart, not a freaking shooter. Animal Crossing. But while it was a strange backdrop for that, it did work much better with this sort of concept. Now, interestingly enough, Animal Crossing didn't always have that e-reader compatibility. In its original N64 release in Japan, there was nothing of the sort. You might notice 
that post office feels a little bit off in this version, like something's missing, right? Yeah, because obviously being an N64 game, there wasn't any Game Boy Advance related content yet. It wasn't until the GameCube re-release, Dobutsu no Mori Plus, that they added features you can unlock using a Game Boy Advance and a link cable, giving you access to stuff like the island and other features. Though while this version of the game did have GBA compatibility, it was still void of anything related to the e-reader. You might notice that this version of the game still does not have that terminal in the post office. That stuff didn't come until the Western release that most of us today know as Animal Crossing. Unlike most localizations, Animal Crossing's actually added a lot of new stuff, the e-reader being one of them. But of course, they're not just gonna let us have all the fun. Yet another version was made for Japan, Dobutsu no Mori E+, or Animal Forest E+, as we often call it in English. This one included a lot of the new content from the Western version, which of course includes the e-reader compatibility. Oh man, it even came bundled with a thing. Yo, check this out. They had a whole box set and everything. That's so cool. I've noticed the Japanese e-reader looks slightly different from ours. The uh, logo is a little different, sporting the same E Plus branding that this new version of Animal Crossing also used. It's kind of funny to me how Nintendo thought this thing was going to be such a hit that they even bundled the freaking game with it in Japan. There's probably so many Japanese people that have one of these and have never used one just because they bought this version of the game. Compatible versions of the game, which would be anything that isn't these first two, had a machine in the post office you could interact with to scan a card. And there is a lot of these cards, so let's go over each type. The bulk of this whole thing is in the character cards, and there is one for each of the dozens and dozens of dozens of characters in that first Animal Crossing, which includes both villagers and the NPCs, like uh, Red and Rossetti. Some of these cards even have two characters on them, with uh, two dot codes in the back, one for each. This is what made Animal Crossing such a good series to make trading cards for. There's so many characters. You pull a pack off the rack and you open it up to see if you get your favorite villager. The back of these cards were really cool. They had a lot of information about that character. You got their horoscope sign, what clothes they wear, their catchphrase, even a short biography for each one. Everyone loves Bob's laid back attitude, in spite of his nasty habit of spitting whenever he speaks. Gross. Ever wonder why he sleeps so late? It's because he's up all night playing video games. Yo, Bob's a gamer, dude. Goose is always on the go. He goes to bed early gets up early, and he eats, talks, and shrugs you off quickly. Kinda sounds like a jackass, honestly. Okay, one more. Uh, Crazy Red wants you to buy, 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 but his black market prices are high, high, high. Don't be distracted by the trinkets he hawks. Uh, see if you can't sniff out that one rare gem he's selling in his tent. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what that's pretty much what Red's all about. Perhaps the most peculiar thing on the back of these cards is a password. Yeah, I remember that weird password system Animal Crossing had. Well, it's not that. You spend way too long typing this big long thing to Tom Nook, and he goes, "Oh, sorry, dum dum. You're supposed to write this in a letter to a villager, but but type it in this exact same way with the weird key symbol, or it's not gonna work." Okay, so you buy some stationery, you start writing a letter to Lobo, grab Lobo's card, type in that password on the back, send a letter, wait until the next day, and you get a letter back from him telling you to stop writing him gibberish. What do you... Oh, I see. These passwords are as touchy as they are lengthy. It has to be exact or it won't work. Funny enough, you don't actually have to send the letter to the character on the card. You don't even have to have them in your town either. Just send that password off to literally anybody and you'll get a letter back from the person on the card instead. But I guess it makes sense though, because there's cards for characters that you wouldn't normally be able to send a letter, like uh, Tom Nook, Rossetti, uh, Tortimer, all of those non-villager NPCs. But uh, yeah, let's fire a couple of these off and see what we get. Uh, Bob gave me a GameCube logo. Ooh, that's cool as hell. Uh, Cookie gave me a sunflower. That's sweet. Lobo gave me a talking to because I cast Capitalize the M. This is actually kind of weird if you think about it, like sending a bunch of nonsensical passwords to a person and getting a letter back with a present from a different person. That's like some secret agent malarkey that freaking drug dealers would use. But yeah, getting letters and items is pretty cool, but it's such a dumb and lengthy process to even get to work. But I guess we haven't even got to actually scanning these cards yet, so uh, if you zip one of those dot codes onto the e-reader, you can get a little message from that character on your Game Boy Advance. These take so much less time to make work, there's no passwords, no waiting a day, you just swipe the card and the message pops up. And they're a lot more interesting than the letters you receive in-game too, often telling fun little stories about that character. Bob explains how he passed out hunting mole crickets in the middle of the night, <laughs> what the hell? Teddy explains that he can't shake trees anymore because he's so ripped if he did he'd tear them out of the friggin' ground, that's sick as hell. These messages are pretty fun, a lot of really cute and dumb stuff. Uh, some cards let you learn some pretty interesting facts about these characters, like a Booker's for example, it reveals that he does actually know you don't own anything you're claiming in the lost and found. 
he just doesn't really care. This whole time, I thought he was either just an idiot or he was too timid to speak up, but no, he just doesn't want to deal with any of it, so he just lets you take it all. Rossetti complains about how much Bob resets. Dude, Bob, you gotta save first. What are you doing? Now, if you scan one of these villager cards at the machine in-game, oh, hold up, you have to, oh, okay, you have to wait for the the e-reader e to download the Animal Crossing software from the GameCube first. It kinda takes forever, but okay, once you got this screen going, you can now scan a card. Doing this also gets you a letter from that villager with a present once again attached, though the letter and present you get from the password is different from the one you get for swiping the card, which means each card has two letters and two presents you can get. But of course, since one requires a long password and waiting an entire day in game, one is way less annoying to do than the other. Now, one thing that is quite disappointing about these cards is that you can't actually scan them to unlock that corresponding villager in your town, unlike the amiibo cards we have today. Like, if I scanned this into New Horizons, or New Leaf even, I would get Bob as a resident in my town, and that's pretty cool. But you can't do that with the old e-reader cards in the old game, and while that is kind of disappointing, it is pretty cool to see how these old dumb ideas evolved into something actually genuinely cool and helpful. One interesting thing I noticed about these cards is that the render actually defer between regions. The characters in the Japanese cards look way blockier. They resembled their N64 counterparts a little more closely, but the Western cards all had updated renders. They smoothed out those features and sharpened up the textures. Bob looks so clunky on the original card. Uh, here's Teddy. Even his posture's a little different. That's interesting. I find it kind of strange that it's the North American versions that have the updated artwork because the e-reader did launch first in Japan, but we got a version of Animal Crossing that even used these cards like half a year before before they did. So I would assume that our cards came first by extension, but that couldn't have been the case if they were clearly updated like this. Well, that's just about everything about the character cards. Up next, we have player cards. Now, there's one for each of the different types of playable characters. These ones you don't scan to the post office. In fact, they're not even for the game at all. Instead, they unlock mini games you can play right off of your Game Boy Advance. These games always involve scanning character cards to load in different villagers. Uh, for example, for Tug of War, you'll have to scan in three villagers you think are the strongest, and then watch and see if they win. Okay, what do we got here? Uh, let's try Grizzly. That's a bear, that'll probably do. Big and strong. Uh, Peewee also looks kind of strong, I guess. Oh, of course, Tank. We gotta use him. I mean, his name's Tank, after all. It's gotta work. If you notice one of your characters is struggling, that's your hint on who to swamp out to get the best results. It is a little bit disappointing how they kind of cheat it by depicting every single character as a generic silhouette and they just put their name on screen instead. I mean, I guess it would have been a lot of work to make sprites for each individual character character, and I understand that, but I don't know, I feel like they could have at least made the silhouette look like the type of animal they are. If you're able to win the minigame, you'll be given a password that you can mail to a villager in the main game for a prize. They're usually not terribly exciting, just regular items. I mean, if you even type the password in right to begin with. There's 16 of these player cards, which means there's 16 of these minigames total. I only have 6 of them though, so I'll show off what I can. Scanning this one gets you a jump rope game. It's pretty similar to the tug of war game, where you just scan in 3 villagers and see if they can do it and if not, you just swap them out until you win. What else? We've also got the three-legged race. Oh, this one's actually a minigame. It requires input, unlike the first two. Uh, you scan somebody you think is fast, and then time the button pushes to race your opponent. And of course, the better character you pick, the faster you'll go. Here's something a little different. Fireworks show. You scan a card, and the fireworks happen. The better the fireworks, the higher the score. And if you score high enough, you get a password. There doesn't really seem to be any rhyme or reason to it. Certain characters just have better fireworks than others. You just keep going until you get a good one. Uh, red seemed to work really well though, but that's probably because he sells fireworks in the game. Fortune telling. Uh, this one's kind of similar in that you just scan a random guy and see what he gets you. Again, there doesn't really seem to be any real consistency here. Some cards give you a good fortune and by extension a prize and others don't. So yeah, just keep scanning random characters and see if you get lucky, I guess. Okay, so now this last one I have is probably the coolest one, but it's also the most infuriating one. Who done it? Somebody did a crime and you gotta scan the character that you think think did it. Copper will give you one new clue for each attempt, sort of like a game of guess who. He'll give you a vague description and you scan a character that you think lines up with that. But while that sounds fun, there's so freaking many of these character cards, so the chances of you even having the one you need are really slim. Unless you have like every card, but who the hell would have that? These hints are also really vague, they could apply to almost anybody. Even having all five, I barely feel like I have an idea of who this is supposed to be. Not in a shouse. That's gotta be a typo. Why is freaking period all the way down there. Jeez, the e-reader definitely didn't have the same degree of care put into the text as the main game did, that's for sure. The minigames are a decent distraction, I guess, but I don't know, I feel like the ideas were a lot better on paper than they were in practice. 
looking through a binder of cards, picking out what characters you want to use, that is a really fun idea. I just wish the minigames themselves were a little more interesting. I also wish they weren't, like, impossible for people that don't have a ton of character cards. You need so many of these or you won't even stand a chance. I also wish they could at least give you better rewards to make them actually worth playing because what you get from them just isn't really worth it. Well, I guess we got a couple more card types here. Uh, there's design cards. You can scan these of the Able Sisters to unlock custom patterns based on other Nintendo games, like Pikmin, Mario, and Yoshi. And not really much else to say on these ones. Then there's music cards. Each one's based on a different KK Slider song. The back of each one shows you how to make that song your town tune. You can scan these ones at the town tune board, and they... Oh yeah, I guess they just give you that town tune, huh? I, I guess that's faster than typing it in, but I was kind of hoping it unlocked something cool. I could have just done this myself. Yeah. Yeah, the bonuses you get from these cards are really underwhelming. They're all just things you can get by normal means. And by continuing to rely on passwords, well, the internet destroyed that concept. You can now just look them all up. But there is one very mysterious thing that was locked away by these cards. Something that you could not normally get. Something that only the e-reader could give you. I'm talking those two fabled NES cards. Yeah, these bad boys right here. These are the two rarest Animal Crossing e-reader cards. Why are they so rare? Well, I'd imagine it's a combination of them being the only ones that actually give you unique items in-game, and the fact they were also from Series 4, which by then barely anybody was even buying these things. I went on a pretty crazy journey trying to find these two. They rarely show up on eBay, and the two times I actually did find one there, I was outbid. People who want these things do not mess around. But luckily for me, I had somebody help me out. A huge shout out to Seafoam Gaming on Twitter for hooking me up with these two. Uh, I very much doubt I ever would have got my hands in these two cards if it weren't for this guy. And with how rare they were, uh, parting with them seemed to be the end of the journey for the dude. And finally getting these two marked the beginning of a journey for myself. So for that sacrifice, I offer my deepest of appreciation. Thank you so freaking much, man. I appreciate it. So firstly, a little background for this mystery. There's a lot of NES games you can unlock and play in Animal Crossing, but after a while, people started discovering NES games that were on the disc that had no way to be unlocked. Mario Bros, Ice Climber, Super Mario Bros, and Legend of Zelda. For the longest time, it was thought they were completely unused and were only unlockable by cheat devices like Action Replay. But it turns out that two of these games were actually put aside to be unlocked only through e-reader cards, which leads people to believe that the other two were also planned to be released as cards but they never saw the light of day because of the e-reader's commercial failure. These two here did end up getting printed though, but they quickly vanished into obscurity because it came out during the tail end of the e-reader's already dying lifespan. These cards only existed for like two seconds before they were gone. But here they are, those two fabled e-reader NES cards for Animal Crossing. You head to the e-reader terminal in the post office, throw that card to the scanner, and it'll send you a letter from Tom Nook containing the respective NES game. And that is how you get these two without cheats, the way Nintendo Nintendo intended. Well, I'm sure they didn't intend on me hunting these cards down like a madman just to get two crummy NES games I didn't even really care that much about playing, but you know what I mean. It's kind of an unexciting conclusion, honestly, but I guess it was the mystery surrounding the whole thing that made it so much fun. I mean, if these cards all sold really well and tons of people already saw this whole thing, then it wouldn't have been nearly as cool. But one thing I've never been able to get off my mind is if they were going to make these two cards, that means there must exist two dot codes you could scan through a physical e-reader to unlock them. One of my kind of dumb video game dreams is someday a hacking or modding scene, figuring out what those two dot codes were, printing them off, and throwing them through an e-reader to finally unlock those two NES games via the intended means. That would be a really exciting day. But yeah, that is everything the e-reader can do with Animal Crossing. What a tedious, archaic way of unlocking bonuses. As cool as I find this sort of thing, it's no wonder why it failed. Nobody wanted to do any of this crap, not even back then. It's just one of those things that's way better on paper than it is in practice. I mean, the fact that you had to own an entirely different console, and a $40 accessory, and buy packs of random cards for all of this? Yeah, I think you're asking a little bit too much for the average person to really care about this sort of thing, as cool as the intentions were. But that's the beauty of Nintendo. If they have a good idea, they don't get rid of it just because it didn't work the first time they tried it. You guys know what's up, I'm talking amiibo cards. Like, dude, it's literally the same exact thing. Just remove the Game Boy, remove the e-reader, hell, even remove the long scanning process. You just tap the card to the controller and bam, there they are. The idea of Animal Crossing trading cards being able to unlock things in the game, that is really cool. They just had to iron out all of those dumb quirks 
quirks and hurdles that came with older technology. But you know, that's kind of why I love all this old junk. Because it's clunky, because it's dumb and completely unnecessary, but also because it's a piece of history that shows a company I love trying something that did not work, and then making it work years down the road. There is something kind of exciting about that, isn't there? And while the amiibo cards are objectively better at unlocking things in-game, they don't have all of that fun info on the back of them. You just get the amiibo logo. So there definitely is still an appeal to the old cards that you just don't really get anymore. But I guess regardless of how you feel about this big dumb peripheral, I hope you enjoyed learning all about it. I was so stoked for this thing as a kid, and I was so disappointed by it. But I guess now that I've dug all this stuff out to appreciate it in a weird way, I've finally given my kid self-closure. I just really wish I bought those packs of cards, they're all on clearance for 50 cents each. Then again, I also wish I didn't spend 40 bucks on the e-reader. Hey, thanks for watching. Uh, this is like my favorite video I've ever made, I think, because it's just like, it's one of those rare times I get to talk about something nobody cares about but me, and that's pretty cool sometimes. Also, don't forget, I have a Patreon.com on internet. Uh, it's $1 podcast. What?